Well, if you have your Bibles, I want you to turn to James chapter 1. We are going to be talking about hearing God in the Scripture today. And uh, I want you to encourage you to take out your notes. We are going to have a pop quiz in just a few minutes that I think will be a, a lot of fun for us all. You know, when I lived in Tennessee, one day I was driving into the church where I was serving. And I lived in a little small town just north of Nashville. And as, we, as I was driving, nothing really ever happened in that community. So it was a big deal when we saw some construction. And I thought, I wonder what in the world they're doing. So the next day I drove by after they cleared it and they were pouring the slab. And a couple days later, the strangest thing happened. Right there in the middle of this, this slab of concrete, they, they didn't start building walls or anything. They, they, they set this huge silver box. And I thought, that is really strange. I've never seen this before. And then a few days later, they began to, to frame and, and put a roof and build all around this silver box. And I'd never seen it before, so I'm, I, curiosity started getting the best of me. So I started asking around, did anybody know what they're building there? And as soon as they told me what they were building, I go, oh, that makes sense. Anybody know what they were building? What? A bank. I'd never seen a bank built before. And, and the, 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 the bank was the vault. I mean, the vault was the silver box. And it was a real simple principle. They, they couldn't build the building and then try to stick the vault in because it wouldn't fit through the doors. So they built the entire bank around the vault. Well, what the vault is to a bank, Christ is to Christianity, and the Bible is to the Christian. Jesus is the living word. The Bible is the written word. And together, they are the very foundation of the Christian life of which we need to build our lives around. It is the breath of God. We find through Scripture several different passages. One of my favorite comes out of Psalm 19. It says, the law of the Lord is perfect reviving the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are sure and altogether righteous. You can go through to Psalm 119, an entire psalm. It actually goes through the Hebrew alphabet. It does nothing but speak of the Word of God. The longest Chapter in the Bible by far is about the importance and the vitality of the Word of God. You go into the Gospels and you have verses like 2, 2 Timothy 3, 16, 17 says the Word of God is, the, all Scripture is God-breathed and it's profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, and training in righteousness. For what purpose? So that every one of us would be thoroughly equipped under a good service. Hebrews talks about how it's a surgeon's scalpel. All through the Bible, we learn its importance into a believer's life. Well, for the last several weeks, we've been discussing how to hear the voice of God. And I've shared many times, the Christian life is about knowing God, hearing his voice, so that you can do what he tells you to do. And the key element in hearing God's voice and distinguishing God's voice, I believe, is his word. See, God likes to speak through rhema into our lives, specifically into our lives. And, and the chosen vehicle he uses to speak rhema, to confirm rhema, is the logos, which is his written word. And so if we're going to rightly divide and apply the scriptures to hear God speak, it's going to require that we have to, it's going to require that we are a people who know the Bible, who understand how to to glean from it and how to apply its principles to our lives. But here's the simple reality. You can't, you can't know something if you don't read it, if you don't invest time in it. It requires effort. And, and so just for grins this morning, and I want to share with you before I even do this, I'm not trying to embarrass anybody, but I am trying to make a very important point. So stay with me as we go through this. I want everybody to pull out your, your sheet that looks like this. We're going to have a pop quiz Ready? No cheating. No looking over someone's shoulder. No getting answers from someone else. We do not need to pull our ignorance. Okay? All right, here we go. Question number one. There's ten questions. 
Question number one, how many books are, they in the, are there in the Bible? 58, 64, 66, or 70? Don't answer, write on your piece of paper. Come on. All right, second question. How many animals did Moses take on the ark with him? All right, next question. Who was Noah's wife? I'll give you a couple of hints. Othella, Marge, Joan of Arc, or Nama, or other. <laughs> this means I don't know. <laughs> All right, here's a tough one. List for me very quickly, and you can just use one word. List for me very quickly five of the Ten Commandments. List five of the Ten Commandments. Here's one that's a little hard. Could be hard. Which Old Testament books do not include the name of God? There's two of them. All right, here's an easy one. It's got two parts to it. The book of Hezekiah is in the New Testament or Old Testament? The book of Thomas is in the New Testament or the Old Testament? I added one. That's B. All right. Who were Sodom and Gomorrah? Husband and wife? Best friends? Two neighboring cities? Or the newest players on the Atlanta Falcons? <laughs> Number eight, what are the four Gospels? My favorite question, which book says God helps those who help themselves? And the last, can you quote one verse from memory and give me the address? If you, do, you don't have to write it all out. Just say, here's the verse I know from memory. Okay, so why this quiz before we come to the answers? Because as George Gallup said recently, Americans say they revere the Bible, but by and large, they do not read it and they do not know it. Americans have become a nation of biblical illiterates. So just for fun, how many books are in the Bible? 66. How many animals did Moses take on the ark with him? Zero. It was Noah. <laughs> who, was ne who was Noah's wife? They're really, they, do not, they do not know for sure. Uh, tradition says it was Nama. But actually, they do not know who Noah's wife was. Ten, five of the Ten Commandments. Give them to me. No other gods. Don't take the Lord's name in vain. Shall not steal. Keep the Sabbath. Honor your. Do not covet. Okay, we got five. Next. Uh, what books in the Bible do not include the names of, do not include the name of God? <laughs> Esther and Song of Solomon. It, is the book of Hezekiah Old Testament or New Testament? Neither. Neither. Book of Thomas, Old Testament or New Testament? Neither. Neither. Uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, what were they? Cities. Two cities. They were not best friends. <laughs> Four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Pretty easy. Which book says God helps those who help themselves? None. I'm so, so glad to hear you say that. And, and we won't do the verse. Now, now listen to this. Here's the reason I ask those questions. 50% of church-going adults cannot name the four Gospels. 
50%. 60% of Christians cannot name five of the Ten Commandments. 81% of Christians think that the book of Proverbs says God helps those who help themselves. 50% of seniors in high school think Sodom and Gomorrah were married. 12% of adults believe Noah's wife was Joan of Arc. Now listen, I didn't share that with you because, because of any other reason. You know, I didn't, you, know, you look at those questions, that, those are questions for trivial pursuit. We're not playing Bible trip pursuit. The reason I ask those questions is because God wants to speak into our lives. He wants to guide us. He wants us to know him, have a relationship with him. And the truth of the matter is, if we do not invest time in this word, we are not going to know him. And when you learn, when you start reading the scriptures, you're going to learn about God. But more importantly, you're going to come into a relationship with God. And so it requires time and effort. I would say it this way. It's absolutely impossible to have a vibrant, healthy, effective, intimate walk with God apart from his scripture. And so if you are trying to live this Christian life independent of the scripture, I promise you this. Your spiritual life is anemic. It's anemic. God's word is the lifeblood of the Christians of the Christian walk and it requires that we spend time and so what I want to do today is take give you four principles for how to handle God's word according to the book of James James chapter 1 we're going to start in verse 19 my brothers take note of this everyone should be quick to listen slow to speak slow to become angry because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires therefore Get rid of all moral filth and the evil that's so prevalent and humbly accept the word planted in you which can save you. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but doesn't do what it says is like, a, is like someone who looks at his face in the mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard but doing it, they will be blessed and what they do. Okay, so four principles. Principle number one is very simple. If you want to hear God speak into your life, if you want God to guide your steps, if you want God to have influence over you, then you need to experience God's word daily. That book, that verse in Psalms I'd read, he says, you'll be, he says to meditate on his word day and night. That it's to be constantly on your mind, constantly in your thoughts, that as you read it, you, you, you ruminate on it, you, you mull it over, you spend time, you, you, you try to get every morsel out of it. It's not just a verse a day to keep the devil away to approach. It is to, to seek, to, to, to uncover a precious jewel. Uh, it's kind of like the, the, the parable of the lost pearl and the lost coin. You, you're, you're tearing things up in order to get to the, the, the true value of what God's trying to say to you. I found this interesting. I did a, some research this week and, and discovered that Lifeway recently did a poll asking Americans. This was in 2014. They, they asked Americans what they believed about the Bible. Interesting statistic. Number one, this isn't going to be up here. 88% of Americans own a Bible. 98% of churchgoers own a Bible. What was interesting is, is and I'm going to go do this a little backwards, 28% of Americans do not believe the Bible is the Word of God. Excuse me, 28, only, there's only 28% believe, I got that wrong. 28% of Americans believe the Bible is the Word of God. Meaning, 72% believe it's some form, but it's not infallible, it's not inerrant, and many don't believe at all that it's the God's Word. Just 28%. 58% of churchgoers believe the Bible is the infallible, inerrant Word of God. Now think about that. What they're saying is, and when the Bible says that it's inspired by God and profitable for doctrine, proof, correction, training, righteousness, 42% of churchgoers say, nah, I don't think that. Scary. Now look at this. 11% of Americans read the Bible on a daily basis. 19% of church people read the Bible 
on a daily basis. That would be basically about this portion of the room. In our room. Do you read the Bible on a daily basis? 25% of Americans say they read it weekly to monthly, and 27% of church people say they read it weekly to monthly. 34% of Americans say they never read the Bible. 18% of church people say, I never read the Bible. How in the world are we to hear from God, to follow him, to obey him, to allow him to guide our steps. If we take the very mechanism he gave us and we throw it out the window. What it tells me is that we don't care if God speaks. That, that God's a nuisance to us. He gets in our way. He, he thwarts my plans. That, that I think that my way is better than his way. Now, some of us, we don't think that, but we live that. And we live it because we're lazy. We live it because we're busy. We live it because you can come up with any excuse you want to come up to. But the fact of the matter is, as a country, in case you haven't noticed, our country doesn't really care at all. And so James says, listen, everyone must be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry. For man's anger doesn't bring about the righteous life God desires. It sounds like three different ideas, but the truth is this is one sentence. This is one continual thought. There's actually three ideas in this one continual thought, and it's based upon the first one. In fact, the, the idea of being quick to listen requires that you're slow to speak and slow to become angry. And so let me, let me explain that to you very quickly. This is really interesting. The first thing that we need to have, we're going to experience God's word daily, is a critical ear. We, we, we need to filter what comes in and what goes out. We talked about that a couple weeks ago. Quick to listen, it, it, it has the idea that we're to swiftly, carefully, continually, and skillfully put ourselves in a position to hear God speak by seizing every opportunity to be exposed to God's truth. So when the Bible says in Psalms, to meditate on it day and night, it doesn't mean that you're just to read a verse and sit there all day and do nothing. It, instead, it means to continually put yourself in a position to where you can hear God's word, whether you're pick, whether it's spend, spending time in your, in your daily quiet time, listen to, to Christian music or to, or to sermons or to teachings on the word of God, to interact with people and discuss God's truth with them, to get into a small group, to come to hear a message, to watch it on the radio, or listen, watch it on the radio, there you go. Watch it on TV or listen to it on the radio. It's, it's to constantly have it around your life so that you're thinking about it, so it permeates your thoughts. And the reason is, is like Psalm 119 says, if thy word have I hid in my heart, for what purpose? That I might not sin against God. So that, so that I might be in relationship with him. The word in, 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 in uh, Psalm 1, it says, he delights. It's an interesting word because it means to bend towards. Have you, have you ever been in a conversation with someone and you're really listening intently? Have you ever noticed how they bend toward it, toward the conversation? They want to make sure they get it. They're paying full attention. That's what, that's what he's saying here. When you delight, you're bending towards God to listen to him. You have the right attitude. You, you, you have the right disposition. You're anxious. You're eager to hear God speak into your life. That's what he means by delighting in the Lord. One person wrote it this way. It says the appeal is for believers to seize every opportunity to increase their exposure to Scripture by taking advantage of every privileged occasion to read it and hear it. This eager desire for such learning is one of the surest marks of a true child of God. If he, when he is blessed, he turns to the word for thanksgiving and praise. When he is troubled, he searches the word for comfort and encouragement. In times of confusion, he looks for words of wisdom and guidance. When tempted, he searches for the power to resist. We must be quick to hear. And we do that by putting ourselves in a position for God to speak. 
But then he goes from a critical tongue to, I mean, excuse me, a critical ear to a controlled tongue. He says, be slow to speak. Interesting phrase, slow to speak, because it refers to more than just than not speaking too quickly. It means to weigh what has been said. So that when I'm in a conversation with someone, if I'm too quick to, to listen, if I'm too quick to speak, then what's happened is, is I've not measured what has been spoken to me. Does that make sense? And so when God is speaking, I, I don't need to be sitting there going, oh, you know what, God, I, I don't know that I agree with that. I, 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 it's, it's arguing with God, debating with God. You know, God, I don't know that what you're telling me is true. Or, or God, I don't know if what you're saying applies to my situation. It's arguing with him, maybe not verbally, but in our hearts. God is saying something, and, and because it doesn't suit us, we begin to debate with him and argue with him. And so he says, listen, if you're constantly telling God what's right, or if you are, are thinking about what you're going to say to God to justify your actions when it comes to what he has spoken to you, you're never going to hear God speak. And so you should be quick to listen, slow to speak. And then third, you need a calm disposition. You need to be slow to become angry. See, if the natural response to a Godward life is to receive the word, then the natural response of the carnal life is to reject the word. But when God speaks, we find this, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, when God, when God speaks, Paul says, when God speaks and confronts our idolatry, when God speaks and confronts those things that are not his heart for us, but they're our heart in this world, the, the natural response is anger, rage, filthy language from our lips. That's what he says in Colossians 3. We start battling back with God. The word anger here, it means, it's a smoldering agitation. It's an anger that's privately harbored, and it's a resentful spirit that says, God, I don't want you to tell me what to do. Here's the thing about God's word. Hebrews says it this way. The word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. It pierces even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It discerns the thoughts and intents of the heart. What God's word does, it's like it, it, it goes right to the issue. It confronts the sin, the cancer in our lives. God's word, it, it, it's like it's got, getting a CAT scan. We're getting... We're getting scanned every time we open it it scans our hearts it scans our motives it scans our mind and it deals with those issues in our hearts that are hindering us from having an intimacy with God and and when, when that happens God's going to confront not just the sin he's going to come he's going to confront the opinions that I have that do not line up with his will and with his word and when that happens, we have, we're forced into a situation. Am I going to agree with God or am I going to fight with God? Because that's your only two options. Okay, God, I believe what you say. Or, you know what, God, I don't like what you say. I don't want to receive what you say. And so that's where the anger comes out. So he says, listen, you've got to be quick to hear. You've got to be quick to put yourself in a position so that God can speak, and when he does speak, just be ready. He, he doesn't want you to debate him about it. He wants you to listen and let it sink in, and, and, and if you do debate it, what you're going to find is you're going to start arguing with God, and that's an indication that you're really not in fellowship with him, that you're running from him. And so that's the first thing. Experience God daily. Second principle, examine your heart or examine your life honestly. He says, get rid of the moral filth and the evil that's so prevalent. All through the Bible, the Bible tells us to be on your guard. Be alert that Satan's roaming around seeking whom whom he may devour. He tells us to guard our hearts because our hearts are the wellspring of life. And it's warning us that, that if we allow sin to get impacted into our lives, it will inhibit our ability to hear God speak. And so he uses this interesting phrase, and I shared this last week, get rid of the moral filth and the so evil that's prevalent. The word get rid is to discard, it's to strip away. It's actually a word picture of a snake getting rid of its dead skin. 
leaving it behind, shedding that which is, which is, is dead and has no value to you. He says, so strip away the moral filth and the evil. Evil are acts of commission. The word moral filth, is, is, and I shared this last week, it refers to sin that causes the building up of wax on your spiritual ears so that you cannot hear God speak. That's what sin does. Sin inhibits our ability to hear. It muffles the sound of God. And so he says the, the second thing you've got to do is that every day, moment by moment, Day by day, you've got to go through and you've got to say, okay, God, are we okay? Is there anything inside of me? The psalmist said this way, search me, O God, and know my heart, know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any wicked way in me. See if there's anything in me that's separating me from you. And if there is, lead me back to you. Lead me back to get it right. Lead me to a point of confession so that I can get things right. And so we're to hear it. And this is what Paul talked about in Colossians 3. Listen to what he says to the Colossians. You must rid yourself, same word in the Greek, of such things as these. Anger, rage, malice, slander, filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other since you have taken off, shed, you've scaled away the old self with its practices, have put on the new self. As God's chosen people, holy, dearly loved, clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, gentleness, patience. He says, clothe yourself with the fruit of the Spirit. There's only one way to clothe ourselves with the, Spirit, with, the, with the fruit of the Spirit, and that is to plug in and to abide in Christ. And abiding, what abiding really breaks down to is I'm going to plug in and be obedient to God. And so the easiest way I know, I know to tell you to abide in Christ is that when you read God's word and God says, do this or don't do this, then if he says do it, you do it. If he says don't do it, then you don't do it. Because obedience is how we abide in Christ. And this is God's general revelation to us. And so when I do what he tells me in this book to do and don't do what he tells me not to do, I abide in him. I, I'm plugged in. I, I, I give God the freedom to do his work in my life. Sounds pretty simple, huh? Third principle. Embrace God's word humbly. He says, after he says, get rid of the moral filth and so prevalent, the evil is so prevalent, and humbly accept the word planted in you. The word humbly means to receive it with a teachable spirit. To receive it. This, this, is, this is juxtaposed to the idea of getting angry. Instead of getting angry about it, realize that God is speaking to you for your good and for your intimacy. That God's never going to speak to you to push you away. Remember last week we talked about the love of God? Or was that two weeks ago? We talked about the love of God and how much God loves you and wants a relationship with you. God is never going to confront you to push you away. He's going to confront you to draw you to him. And so when he speaks to us, he's not speaking to us for our harm. He's speaking to us for our good. He's speaking to us as, as a good, good father would speak to us. It's an amazing, amazing truth here. And I love this next part. He says, the word that's planted in you. It's a passive word in the Greek. Which means when I open up my Bible and I begin to pray and study, I can read it. And I can go, oh, that means this. But it's when God plants understanding of this. Not, 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 it's not saying, okay, I get the fundamentals. It's when it comes to life and when it has meaning behind it. That is when God takes it and says, let me let this grow in your life. And so God does the work. He is the one who makes the deposit that brings interest of truth into our lives. 
So when, when you have clarity of understanding, it's not you, it's not your human ability, your human wisdom. It's the Spirit of God speaking rhema so that you have clarity to God's truth. Now here's the, here's the big point. What's your job, what's my job in this process? It's to open up the Bible, to read it, expecting God to give us understanding through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And so I pick it up and I go, okay, God, today I'd like for you to speak to me. Today I'd like for you to show me truth. Today I'd like for you to, to speak into my situation so that I can live according to your word. And according to this scripture, God says, okay, I'll give it to you. Now, that doesn't mean it's going to always come easy. Sometimes he's going to make a search. Sometimes he's going to make a seek. Sometimes he's going, to, he's, going to, he's going to kind of lead some breadcrumbs because there's lessons along the way that are really important to our lives beyond that, that, that one little truth. But he still does that because he is the one who's responsible for, for helping us to live this word. And then the fourth principle. We express God's word honorably. Here's the very simple truth. The only reason to receive the word is to respond to it. The reason to hear it is to heed it. And so he says this to, in, in the book of James. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Prove yourselves by doing what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but doesn't do what it says is like a man who looks at his face in the mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But the man who looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues to do it, not forgetting what he has heard but doing it, he will be blessed in what he does. The word listen here is, it, it means to be passive. It's to listen passively. It's to listen with no intent to put into practice. And so he says, do not merely listen. Do not, do not audit the Jesus class. If you've, ever, if you've ever seen students audit a class, what they do is they come, they want the information, but they do not necessarily want the accountability. They want the information, but they don't necessarily want to do the work. In every class I've ever had that someone audited, they came and listened, and while I was writing papers and taking tests, they were laughing. They thought it was funny. But when the end of the class was over and I got a grade and I got credit for the class, I was laughing because they got no credit. They paid the same amount of money and they got no credit for it. And the same thing happens spiritually. What James is saying, do not be like a person who audits the word of God. You want the credit. You want, you want to make sure that you get the credit for what God's investing inside of you. So don't, don't listen passively. Listen with the intent of doing it. Listen to, with the intent of making it happen. So he says, do not deceive yourselves. Prove yourselves by doing what it says. I love this word doing, or doer. The actual word in the Greek is poete. And, and it means to be immersed to the point that you put it into motion. So I'm going to immerse myself into God's word so I put it in motion. Here's the point. This is more than practicing what you hear. It is becoming what you hear. If you don't get anything else from today's message, this is what you need to get. I open up the word of God not to passively read it. I open up the word of God to become like the word of God. It's not something I just look for for principles and precepts. I am to absorb it. It is to become my life. I like the way William Barclay says it. He says, James does well to remind us that what we hear in the holy place must be lived in the marketplace. Or else there's no point in hearing it at all. There's no point. Maybe I can say it this way, maybe a little better. Christianity is not a noun. It's a verb. It's not a noun. 
If you think that, if, if, if you say, I'm a Christian and there's no life that goes with it, then you're not a Christian. Christianity has always been, from the very first moment, it's always been a life to be lived, not a title to be worn. Always. One person said it this way, on that day when you stand in front of Jesus, he is, you're, you, you, he's not going to say, well fought, well said. He's going to say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Johnny Hunt says it this way, if you're going to hear God say well done, then you're going to have to do well. You're going to have to do well. Now, this is not in your ability. This is in response to what God is doing. When God speaks, you say, okay, God, I will do what you say. That's the reason I keep saying, coming back and saying the Christian life is knowing God, hearing his voice, so that you can do what he tells you to do. The key in all this is in the doing. And so to clarify this point, he gives a great illustration, James does. He says, you'll be like a man who looks at himself in a mirror, and if you walk away and immediately forget what you look like, you've missed the point. What does a mirror do? A mirror reflects the outside of an individual. If I put a full-length mirror up, I'm going to see every quality and every blemish of my life. I'll see if I've got a wrinkle. I'll see if I don't have wrinkles. I'll see if everything looks pressed. And it, it reflects the outside of an individual. What does God's word do? It's a mirror that reflects the inside of an individual. It measures who you are. It brings up every quality. It shows every flaw. Not to say, look how bad you are, but to point you to look how awesome Jesus is that he can take care of those flaws and bring you into intimacy and make you whole. I have a challenge for every one of you this week. I want every one of you this week, women, this includes you. I want every one of you this week to get dressed to go through your day and never once look at a mirror. To check your makeup, to check, make sure your hair is in place, to make sure, guys, that you shave every part. Isn't that, isn't that really frustrating? It's when you shave and all of a sudden you get out, of, you know, you get through shaving, you get out of the shower and you, and you rub your hand and you're like, going, oh man, I missed a big old honking space right here. Do one week, one week. Who'll take the one week challenge not to look at a mirror? You're a bunch of pansies. <laughs> no takers? Okay, then I have a different challenge for you. How many of you today will say, every time I look at a mirror to look at my outside, I'm going to pick up God's word and look at the mirror for my inside? How many of you will do that? That's good. I can assure you of this, God is far more concerned about what's going on the inside than he is what's going on the outside. And his word is a mirror to reflect us. And so here are the four principles. Experience God's word daily, daily, daily. How often? Daily. daily. Examine your life as you're reading his word, examine your life. Third, embrace it with humility. Be ready to receive what he says to you. Don't fight him on it. Receive it. And then fourth, express his word honorably. Live it out as he speaks to you. Well, as you all know, I, I, I'm, I'm very big on when God speaks to us, responding to him. And if today, as is, is, is we close out the service, I want to challenge you. If you today would say, you know what, I might pick up my Bible once a week, once a month. I want to challenge you to be one of those people who speak, pick, up your, pick up the Bible once a day minimum. And if that's you today, what I'm going to ask you to do in just a moment as we pray, have our invitation. You can, do, you can respond one of two ways. One is you can come to these altars and just make a new commitment. I can promise you, I read the Bible every day, but I'm going to be down here, I'm going to be the first one here, and I'm going to make a new commitment today to be a man of the word. So you can come to the altar. 
if because of health reason or because you, you just don't, don't feel comfortable doing that, then what I'd like for you to do is take the little tab here and in this little space that says prayer request, just put, just, you can put your initials over here, but right here, I want you to put, I commit. Or you can put Bible. You know what you're committing to. And I want you, at the end of the service, when you're walking out, to drop it in one of our boxes as a commitment that you're making to God to be a person of his word. Let's stand together. Thank you, Father, for the truth. Thank you, Father, for the scripture. I pray, Father, that today that we all would trust you and to believe that you have your best interest at heart in our lives and that you want to show that to us through your word and that we would commit to be people of your word. Lord, I know that before we can ever be, before we can ever commit to be a person of the word, we have to make a commitment to Christ as our Savior. And Lord, if there's anyone here today who's never done that, They've never said, I understand that I'm a sinner and that Jesus died for me and that I would receive him by faith that he would come into my life and rescue me into a relationship with him. Father, if that's never been done, I pray that today that before we make any other decisions, we make that commitment. But Father, for those of us in this room who have done that, I think we all understand how critical your word is to our lives. That it is the primary vehicle by which you speak to us. That Lord, you would give us a new desire, a new hunger, a new commitment to be people in your word. And I thank you, Father, for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Once you respond as God leads you.